Okay. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today, either in person or online. Um, I'm Sarah Dorpinghouse. I'm the Director of Digital Services at the Special Collections Research Center, and I am a member of the UK Libraries Research Data and Scholarly Communications Committee, and that's the group that's been putting on this workshop series. Today, I'm going to be talking about the preservation of research data, and I just want to start with a caveat explaining that I'm coming from a cultural heritage background, and the topic of preserving research data is huge. It's absolutely massive. And so my, the things that I'm going to talk about today are going to be really basic principles, and then they're also going to be perspectives from the cultural heritage side of things. They're it, you know, it certainly carries over into the scientific side or the more analytical side, but I just want to make sure everybody understands that. So today, um, the main things that we're going to be talking about are why we need to preserve research data, what exactly should be preserved, how we're going to do that preservation, including how are we going to ensure that people can access and discover those files, where to put the files, and different tools and resources. And so it's going to be, I'm sorry, it's going to be pretty lecture heavy because there is so much information. Um, but I did set aside some time at the end of the workshop to go through a fixity activity, um, which there's instruction for instructions for in that Google Drive folder. If you didn't have a chance to get it downloaded, we can walk through that later when the time comes. So preservation of data. I want to first make sure that we all understand that preserving data is actions that are taken to ensure continued access to and use of digital content. So we're talking about being able to access it and actually use it in a meaningful way, which is much more than just simply backing up or making multiple copies of your data. Um, the time for preserving data, I mean, basically you can preserve data for as long as necessary, as long as possible, or indefinitely. So maybe for as long as necessary, maybe you only want to preserve that information for the period of your grant or for X amount of years after your grant. Some people, they want to pervert, preserve it as long as they can, but if it gets really challenging, it's not the end of the world if they lose that data. And then for other folks, um, especially cultural heritage institutions, you really are expected to preserve that data as long as you, well, indefinitely, really, to take all the, all the um, recommended steps to do so. And like I was saying before, it really does go beyond just having backups, but what I'm gonna focus on is a spectrum of options. So I'm gonna talk about things that you can do as an individual or you can help faculty do as a single person or a small group of people to preserve their research data all the way out I forgot to click the slides, I'm sorry. All the way out to sort of an enterprise system-wide way of preserving research data. So, first question, why do we even need to do this? Why are we here talking about this today? And um, for those online or those in the group, do you have any ideas? Why do we, why do we need to care about this? Good, so it can be reproduced. Excellent. What are we reproducing the data for? Why do we need to reproduce it? Excellent, so other people can use it. Any other reasons why we might need to reproduce the data? Excellent. Okay, you guys are good. You pretty much hit on all the reasons. Um, yeah, you want to preserve data because it ensures that people can analyze that data in the future um, or they can reuse it in the future. So reanalysis, really that's um, about looking at your study and your conclusions and being able to reproduce that, right? That's a big part of scientific experimentation and other sorts of experimentation, you want to be able to reproduce that study and get the same results. Um, it's also important to preserve data because you can do additional analysis and experimentation on a similar data set. Um, and then restoration, that's, that's sort of the 
cover your rear end in case somebody accidentally deletes the copy that you're working with. You want to have backups, essentially. Um, so when we're talking about reusing and reanalyzing research data, this fits in very nicely with UK's overall mission, not just the libraries, but UK campus-wide. Um, so our mission statement states that specifically, we are here to serve a global community by disseminating, sharing, and applying knowledge. Research data and the preservation of it and dissemination of that strongly supports that. So this is something that we as information professionals need to be aware of. We also need to work with our faculty to help them to understand that this truly is part of their responsibility as a member of the UK community. Um, and like Christy mentioned, <laughs> a lot of granting agencies mandate having some sort of preservation strategy. Um, I know NSF has one, or it has different uh, grants that require data preservation. Special Collections Research Center, whenever we apply for grants, we always have to submit some sort of preservation strategy. And that's just the way that things are working now, is you have to have some sort of preservation system to get that funding. Um, the other reason why we need to preserve research data is because there are some inherent challenges, um, especially when the material that we're producing is largely digital. So even if you produce data and you set it aside, that's not quite good enough, even if it's just sitting on some sort of external drive, because there are passive things, passive threats that can happen to the research data, um, including physical format obsolescence and degradation. So you, I mean, we've all seen this, right? Three and a half inch diskettes, people aren't really using those anymore. Even CDs, DVDs, I would even argue external drives, those are, those are, are kind of going out the back door now as far as storing information. We're all looking towards the cloud. File format obsolescence. Um, I mean, think about all these proprietary tools that we use like Photoshop or even Microsoft Office, and they have old versions of those. They're doing a little bit better job of, of helping us migrate to those new file formats, but they're, there's definitely formats that we simply don't use anymore. Um, same with software. I mean, I grew up using Clarisworks before Microsoft Office was around. I don't know if anyone else used that, but um, Multiplan is sort of an old version of Excel. Anyway, we've seen this happen over the past 20 years. Software has come and gone, and so we need to make sure that when we're preserving research data, it's not solely dependent on a particular type of software or a particular type of operating system or a particular type of hardware. That's another problem. Um, we're seeing this now with, you know, you, many laptops don't come with CD drives. Um, some of that is because we're less dependent on CDs for storing information. Um, some cases this is kind of, it's been the least, least problematic because you can still hop on eBay and find old, like um, either old drivers or get USB plug-in drivers for three and a half inch diskettes. But um, there are some formats like those five inch floppy disks that were around in the 80s. Those are really, really hard to find for hardware to um, read those disks. So these are all things that we need to think about and reasons why we need to have a solid preservation plan. So what should be preserved? Again, I'm gonna take this to you guys, either online or in the, the live audience. Do you have examples of things that you think we should be preserving or examples of stuff that you actually are preserving as researchers or maybe that you've worked with faculty to help preserve? Anything that took a long time to collect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. Why? You don't want to have to do it. <laughs> exactly. You may, not, you may not be able to do it. Yeah, yeah. So anything that's difficult to reproduce. What about just like generic file types? or forms of data. No? Okay, well that's all right. I'll give you some examples. <laughs> so raw data, data sets, um, any sort of intermediate product, um, 
you know, this really factors in when you're in the middle of, of doing a complex sort of project, you want to make sure that you're preserving these in between, you know, think, think of like a draft, um, something like that can be important to preserve. Documentation that you've developed, that's very, very helpful. Um, any sort of software or code that you've developed, that can be very important. And of course, the results of your analysis. I mean, really, it just, it depends on your research and your research process, um, and also your resources in general of, of what you can, what you can preserve. Um, and it doesn't all have to be preserved in the same way or in the same place. These are just things that you want to think about when you're working with faculty or when you're wanting to preserve your own research data. Um, so some more specific examples. I have a bunch of different data types up there. So spatial data, temporal data, recorded interviews, models, word counts. Um, Eric at the last faculty meeting gave a really interesting libbyte about data that he's pr produced for another faculty member, Mark Lauersdorf on campus, and it's it's just a massive word count of, of newspaper, like words from newspaper issues, I think a couple billion words, and that's research data. That's something that should be preserved. Uh, research data can come in all sorts of file types, from spreadsheets, databases, audio, video, code, um, and of course, all sorts of file formats. And we'll go into file formats and how they can be problematic a little bit later. But of course, when you're thinking about preserving research data, um, it kind of boils down to cost, right, and what resources you have, because preserving data can be expensive. You have to think about your storage footprint, how much you're storing, and, and how you're gonna store it. So if you're putting content on Dropbox, which isn't really a viable preservation method, but some people think it is, so I'm gonna talk about it. If you're putting it on Dropbox, that's very different than putting stuff on Amazon Web Surface Service Storage like S3, and even Amazon Glacier, that's a different type of preservation method or mechanism, and they cost differently, so you have to figure out what works best for you. You also have to think about the complexity of your data and what sort of supportive and contextual information your data needs. So it's one thing if you have a bunch of recorded interviews or maybe a bunch of photographs and you're just going to put them on a place to, to sit and stay. It's another thing if you're developing data that needs to be referenced by specific software and there needs to be certain protocols for how that data can be accessed by you know, your software, whether it can only happen through a certain IP address or whether it can be available publicly. So there can be security issues that you need to consider when you're thinking about preserving your data. Um, and then going back to what Catherine said, <laughs> You also definitely want to consider how expensive it was to generate your data and if it would be more expensive or, or just as expensive to reproduce it or if you could um, reproduce it in a pretty easy way. So, so a good example is let's say you have a computer program that you developed and this computer program can generate quickly within like 24 hours of computer time, right? That's very different than having data that maybe a team of researchers or student assistants or whatever have been spending their time, human time, tweaking this data, pulling together this data. You know, there, there's a, a, cost, a cost difference between those two. And maybe with the computer generated data, you think that your resources are limited, so you just want to preserve that code, and that's it, because it's very easy and cheap to reproduce that data, where something where you've had a lot of fingers in the pot, that's more, much more expensive to reproduce. So, um, also quality control. Sometimes you have a lot of human time put into checking that data, so that may be more worth saving. Uh, okay, so now we're gonna dip into the meat and the potatoes of it how we actually are going to preserve your research data. And I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try and not get really in the weeds and technical with this, but I, this is the part that I think is super fascinating and I get a little nerded out about it, so forgive me. Um, I also forgot to mention that I was so delighted putting these slides together because 
about two years ago, I downloaded two sets of icons that were specific for digital preservation. <laughs> and this is the first time that I've really got to use them. And they're so great. You'll see some that come up later that are just so perfect. Um, but there is one thing, one set of the, of the icons is from Denmark. And so there are some words that are not in English, but I think you'll be able to figure it out. <laughs> okay. So the, uh, when we're talking about how to preserve research data, there's three major goals in preservation. First, you want to be able to have the materials accessible to the right research community. Now, that research community can be the larger scientific community or cultural heritage community. It can be maybe your specific research team. Maybe you have folks from different universities that are collaborating together. It may be just your department, or it may be just you and your assistants, um, but you want to be able to make sure that the appropriate folks can find that or can actually access that data. Discoverability goes along with that. They have to be able to find that data, and usually that involves having some sort of bibliographic metadata so that it's searchable. Um, and then when they get that metadata, when they can access it and find it, they have to be able to use it. So we have to have all the support, supporting software and hardware to make sure that that data can be used properly. So those are the three goals. Um, there are some cornerstones that help us. They're like founding principles or fundamental principles to help us achieve these goals. Um, the first one is integrity. And integrity is essentially that we want to do what we can to ensure that data is recorded exactly as it was intended. Um, so we, basically it's that integrity is making sure that the data is complete and unaltered as possible. And a lot of times this is done through preserving fixity. You've heard the word fixity before. That's the name of the, the software that we're going to use later. Um, the software is just named after this fundamental idea. So it gets a little confusing. Um, but fixity helps you preserve the integrity of the data. And fixity uh, is really just a process that you can use to make sure that that data is unchanged. And it, it really involves generating checksums on files. So this is, this is the part where I can, I can get a little too deep. And I'm going to try not to. But checksums are unique identifiers for a file, right? So this is something that you're going to create close to the time that a file was created. Um, you're going to use some sort of existing protocol. There's some different protocols and tools out there that help you generate those checksums. If you use, like, so with special collections, we generally use SHA-256 to generate our checksums. Um, that's the type of checksum that we generate. So we take our files, we run them through our checksum tool, we generate a checksum for each file. And the goal is, is those checksums, those original checksums, live with that file, and then a year from now, two years from now, even a day from now, we can take that file, run it through that same checksum protocol, and it should create the exact same checksum for that file. If it's a different checksum, something happened, that file changed, it was altered in some sort of way, maybe it went corrupt. So there's tools out there to help us do this. Fixity is, is one of those tools that we're gonna explore. So this is a pretty integral part of preserving data because we can't, it's not possible for us to open a file every you know, quarterly and make sure that we can still run it and that it hasn't corrupted and it still works with the software that we have. We have to use computers to do that. And so this is one of those things that computers essentially can do for us. Um, the other cornerstone is authentic authenticity. Um, we want to make sure that a record actually is what it appears to be. Um, and sometimes that involves having some provenance, some information that proves that this file truly is what it, what it, what it seems like it is. Um, sustainability is another cornerstone. The files need to be sustainable. It kind of goes back to the file format obsolescence and software obsolescence and hardware obsolescence that we were talking about before. Um, 
it also can go much bigger picture than the file level. And when you're talking about sustainability, you can also talk about having a preservation system that is going to be maintained and sustained by a department or an institution for a long period of time, which is a little bit more challenging. But, you know, sustainability can be the file level all the way up to the administrative level. Now to achieve these goals and to um, kind of structure our work around these cornerstones, we have a lot of standards and best practices for preservation of data because this work can get really technical and complicated quick. And so um, you have a lot of different organizations out there that have been developing standards and best practices that can help us figure out ways to approach preserving our data. Um, I'm only gonna touch upon three of them because there's so many out there, but I tried to pick some that are, are just like across the board fundamental preservation strategies, standards, um, both some high level ones and some low barrier ones. First one that I wanna talk about is the Open Archival Information System. It's often referred to as OAIS. It's not often referred to by its ISO number, but I put it up there anyway, just so you guys have that. So the Open Archival Information System is basically a reference model. It's not an actual system or platform itself. It's just a set of guidelines that says, hey, when you're building a preservation system, these are the components, these are the, the um, different roles that people play that interact with the data and here's generally how it should work it doesn't tell you what tools to use it just says overall you want to consider these things um, and there's three main components you have the producer of the data you have this management layer um, which can be software or people that oversee the preservation repository and then you have a consumer of the data, whether it be a public, other researchers, or maybe the producer themselves, right? Because when you put something into a preservation repository, you also want to be able to pull it out. Um, it goes a little bit deeper than that. And this is that graphic that I was talking about that I'm so excited to use. It's just, it's just so good. <laughs> so you'll see that you still have the producer on the left side, you still have management and you have the consumer, but there's all this stuff going on in this sort of preservation system um, that each play a very important role. And I'm just gonna briefly go through this. I mean, it's kind of like if you think about building a car. And so we all know what a car generally should look like. We all know that it needs to have some sort of wheels. We know there needs to be some sort of engine. I don't know, what else does a car have? Fenders, I guess, maybe? Anyway, but the point is, is that you can have different creators of cars and they do things a little bit differently. So OAS is just telling you, these are generally things that cars have, but you can decide how to produce it or where to put the tires or you know whether you want automatic windows or rolling windows or whatever manual windows um, so some of the things that generally you know should be part of a preservation system it's kind of like a workflow so you start on the left with the producer of the content um, and they are going to create a submission information package or a SIP. You'll see that up there, SIP. So that SIP or that submission information package, it's basically just the stuff that you wanna preserve. It's the content that you created and maybe a little bit of metadata so that you can find it later. They're gonna take that stuff and they're gonna push it into the preservation system or they're gonna ingest it into the preservation system. And then once it goes into the preservation system, there's gonna be an archival copy made. It's known as an archival information package or an APE, <laughs> AIP. So that's the master copy that's gonna hang out in that preservation system. And then while it sits in there, it's gonna interact with the uh, management and administration layer. There's gonna be ongoing preservation planning to make sure that that package can be read on newer types of software. Maybe there's gonna be some file format normalization that happens. Um, and at some point, there's probably gonna need to be some sort of access layer built in. And this access layer can take shape 
in many different ways. It could potentially be some sort of digital library or repository interface that's available to the public consumer. It might be some sort of internal GUI where someone can go in if they have the proper credentials and go in and pull a copy of that archival information package. And so the other three letter term that you see in there is a DIP or a dissemination information package. Um, Cause when you put an archival copy into a preservation system, you don't want to, you know, pull those exact files out again. You want to make a copy of it. And sometimes that copy needs to be structured a little bit differently. Um, so for example, in special collections, when we generate scans of material, they're usually TIFFs, right? Because that's, that's considered the arch archival format. Our users don't always want to interact with the TIFFs because they're really big. Sometimes they just want a PDF of the file. So when we create our dissemination information package, we generate a PDF copy of that TIFF because we know a lot of our users want it. That PDF copy doesn't live in the archival information package because it wasn't part of that original set of data. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So anyway, that's just a very broad, quick overview of OAIS, <laughs> Open Archival Information System. Um, the other thing that I wanna talk about is the Trusted Digital Repository Checklist. Um, this is basically a tool that works side by side with OAIS to make sure that your OAIS or your Open Archival Information System is compliant and doing what it needs to do. This isn't something that you as an individual are gonna sit down and assess your different options for preservation systems. I mean, this is really something that an institution is gonna undertake with a team of people to make sure that their preservation repository is on the right track. Right, so now what we're seeing is we have a lot of individuals on campus and other research institutions are seeing this too. You have people on campus that need to have some sort of preservation system so that they can apply for grants and get grants. Um, it's a very resource heavy, time heavy thing to do. So research institutions now are exploring the idea of having institutional preservation repositories. I wouldn't say the majority of them have them yet. Certainly some institutions do, um, but places are just starting to figure this out. And this trusted digital repository checklist is a good way to start figuring out what you need to have. So what components of an OIS compliant um, preservation system, something that your institution can implement. <laughs> Trying to make this like not totally over the head confusing. Um, so we've used this, UK Libraries has used this checklist to do some self-assessment of our preservation system, just so that we know what the, you know, we're up to date on the standards and we can walk through it and say, yes, our system does this, it does this. Whoa, it definitely does not do that. Maybe we need to figure out if there's a tool out there that can help us do it. Um, or, you know what, we, we definitely don't have this part of the checklist and we never will. So we just need to be aware about it and realize that that's, just simply not feasible at this time. So, um, but it's a, it's a really good place if you wanna dig in deep and get dirty with digital preservation. This is a, it's a good, good place to start. Okay, so those were the two very high level uh, standards and best practices for digital preservation. I'm gonna hit you with something uh, a little bit more introductory level. It's called locks, or lots of copies keep stuff safe. <laughs> Um, it's really all about having multiple copies of things and ideally a uh, geographic distribution and, and it really is what it says it is. Um, hopefully if you are producing data and it's really important to you, you're going to make copies and you're going to save it in different spaces. I mean, I do this, like I did this for these slides today. I emailed myself a copy, I have a copy on my drive, I have a copy on my work computer and a copy on my home computer gets a little challenging trying to keep straight which one is the master copy, but ideally when you have a finalized version of your research data, you can put it in different places 
you combine that with some sort of fixity checker, you know, something that's checking your checksum so that when you find that, you know, this one copy that's stored on this certain external drive, um, there's a little bit of file corruption. You have other places where you can go and find that pure original copy of those files and replace that corrupted version. Um, a lot of cloud storage does this. So if you're putting stuff into Google Drive, they may have servers in Virginia and they may have servers in other places so that if, you know, they have a server go down, there's another copy where they can pull your data from. We are starting to do this in special collections. Um, we're actually uh, starting to copy stuff onto tape drives because it's really inexpensive and they're very stable. And we're sending boxes of these drives to another institution in the United States and they're holding our tape drives and they're sending us their stuff in return. It's just really cheap geographic distribution. So, um, so these are, are real things that people are doing. Okay, now I just threw a bunch of jargon at you guys and you're probably sitting there like, what are you talking about? Like none of this is really that helpful. Seriously, how am I actually going to preserve my research data or what am I actually going to tell the faculty that I'm working with for how they can preserve their data? So there's, um, well, I'll just say the rest of the presentation, I'm going to try and, and keep this a little bit lower level and, and show you some different ways of, of ways that different strategies that you can use for preserving your research data and also some different tools. So the first one is refreshing. This is, um, it's basically moving your data that you're preserving from one format to another. Um, it's, it's a really simple strategy. It's, it's usually not very time consuming. Um, it's really important when you have stuff that's sitting on older formats. I mean, it really combats that format obsolescence. Um, it's certainly required as part, an, part of an overall preservation system, but it's not the only thing that you should be doing. But it's something, right? It's a start. If you have data that's just sitting on old DVDs or, God forbid, three and a half inch diskettes, you might want to consider moving that to some new storage formats that's more readily accessible. Moving, this, moving these files to a new format though, it doesn't mean that you can access those files because you may not have the software or the operating system that those files require. So just want to make sure that that's clear. Um, the other strategy that I want to talk about is replication. This goes back to, back to locks. Lots of copies keep stuff safe. It's basically the same thing. You just want to make a bunch of copies of things. Um, hopefully put them in different places. So if there's some sort of catastrophic failure, you have another copy. Um, replication can also mean bitstream replication. So in some cases, you want to go down to actually preserving the ones and the zeros of the file, right? The ones and the zeros are the bits. It's like the DNA of a file. We're doing this in special collections. Um, if we get a particularly uh, fragile collection or collection of very significant research value, we're actually going to do a disk image of the born digital data that we get, whether it's on a CD or a three and a half inch diskette or a zip drive. Um, and we do this because we know that it's very likely that someone's going to want to access this data in the future, but we don't have the tools to make that data accessible at this time. Or maybe we don't have, like right now we are not doing software preservation at the University of Kentucky Libraries. That's just something we, we don't have some, we don't have the resources to do that. So if we get in a collection that has old file formats and we see that and we're like, oh, we can't can't open these files. We better do a bitstream copy just in case someone down the line really wants to see these files. They may have their own means of getting that software or getting, um, you know, the hardware. It's not the hardware, but the software really to access those files. They can take care of that themselves. And if we can just give them that raw bitstream, that's great. They're going to be happy with that. Another strategy is migration. 
Um, it's, it's similar to what we were talking about for, before with refreshing, um, but migration is usually moving from one sort of system to another. University of Kentucky Information Technology Services is going through this right now, right? There's kind of this massive overhaul where they're moving from physical servers to cloud-based servers. Um, so that, I mean, that's just a thing that kind of happens as technology changes. Migration can also mean converting data from one technology to another. So um, think about, you remember when Microsoft Office just had .doc files, and then they had the new version of their software and it started producing .docx files. And then every time you tried to open a newer, excuse me, an older version of the file in the newer software, it would ask to migrate your file. That's, that's another example of migration. And, you know, as, as we're seeing, uh, software is getting a little bit better about helping us move our files, but it does require that you actually open those files to, to do that, unless you have some sort of other migration plan implemented. Uh, speaking of files um, and migration, normalization is another important part of digital preservation. Um, and it basically means that you're moving files from a proprietary format to an open format. So um, the, po the point of doing this is to, again, ensure that your content is going to be accessible and usable. And I actually can't think of a time when I've created a file using a particular software and haven't been able to open it later. But then again, I'm not producing a large amount of research data. I'm not working with a lot of um, complicated proprietary software. But this is definitely a thing that our research, researchers encounter. And it's something that um, we have started to see come up with our uh, archival collections when we get digital content in is sometimes you get this file and you don't have the software for it and then it's you know it's worthless and, and like I said before that's when we would preserve the bitstream but if that creator of the file had um, saved an open format version of that file that would have really helped us so proprietary formats um, the code isn't open, and that means that people can't develop viewers to, to view that file, right? But if you move something that has an open format, people will be able to create a viewer. Um, and usually, you have a community of developers that will produce these viewers and usually open them for, you know, release them for free. Um, but a good example of this is moving from a Microsoft Office format to something else that's open, whether it be a .txt file, like a text file, or a PDFA, an archival version of PDF. Um, and when you're normalizing your files, you really have to think about what exactly you want to preserve and what's important important enough to preserve. So some people really care about the look and feel of a document. So for example, if you take a PowerPoint slide, and you don't really care about the different animations that are in there. You just want the text to be in there. You can create a PDF copy or a JPEG of that PowerPoint, and that really does the job. Whereas if you want to actually be able to select that, tack, that, that text and extract those characters out of the PowerPoint slide, you might you know, want to try and capture this information in some sort of text-based file. Um, because if you create a JPEG, it's it's you know, challenging, or it's at least another step to try and extract that text. So, um, we're going to talk about normalization again a little bit more later. Uh, the last strategy that I want to talk about, and this is the most fun strategy, and this is also one of those slides that is majority in Danish, and I actually had to Photoshop some English words over there, uh, over the Danish terms, <laughs> so bear with me. But emulation, I think emulation is super cool because it's basically taking this old version of a software or an operating system and reproducing that using newer technology. Um, a really good example of this is what uh, the Internet Archive is doing with their games. So you can actually go onto the Internet Archive and you can look up old MS-DOS games. 
Um, I know I pulled up that old skier game. I don't know if you ski free. Oh my gosh. It was awesome. Um, so they're doing this. They are uh, generating tools that can emulate that MS DOS environment and run these games in that environment. It's super cool. Um, and obviously really important for video games, right? Like that, that is a thing that, that people want to preserve. It's part of our cultural heritage. Um, and it's just really fun. Another example of an institution that is doing emulation is uh, Emory University. Some of you may have heard of this before because it's it was really cool. I mean, it's been a couple years since they did this, but they so they got the Salman Rushdie papers, and his collection that he donated to the archive included a couple of his old computers. And they decided that what they were going to do to try and make his files accessible is they were going to make exact copies of those computers and emulate that entire computer environment on their little, not little, but their, their computers that they have in their, their reading room or their research room. So you go to the Emory archive, you show up, you say, I want to look at the Salman Rushdie papers. They put you down at a computer terminal and they, you know, I'm sure there's some sort of thing that they have to pull up so to, to let you get access to those files. But you basically sort of like remote desktoping into his computer and you see everything as it was. So you see what was on his desktop, you see how he organized his files, you can click through and sort of experience his files in the exact same environment in which he created them. It's super cool really intense to do. It's not something that you're going to do with every collection that you get in, but he gave permission to do it and they saw it as having enough research value to do it. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, so it's, you know, that's not something that your average researcher is probably going to be able to do, but it's definitely a strategy that different institutions are using. Okay, so discoverability and access. This fits into other ways to, to make sure that we can actually preserve our data. Um, I'm gonna just speak very briefly about metadata. Yeah, sorry, again, that Danish. <laughs> You'll figure it out, title, format, date. Um, so Catherine gave a really great workshop on metadata, so I'm not gonna dig in too deep. Um, but just some things to consider. When we're uh, generating research data, you need to have some information there to help it be searchable and findable and actually say what it is. So this can include descriptive metadata, administrative metadata. It's important to know who has intellectual rights to your research data, right? That is an important thing that you want to record. You also want to record the structural data. How do these items relate to each other, especially if it's some sort of complex system um, where certain relationships between the pieces of information need to be retained. Um, Technical metadata, you might want to record what software and hardware is needed to fully access the data. The data. And then, of course, if you've taken any sort of preservation steps, you want to record that too. And that can be checksums. Like, let's say you generated checksums right away. Those checksums are part of the preservation metadata. So something you want to consider. Um, just some general questions. Who, what, when, where. These are the sorts of things that you want to record about your research data. Um, some general tips, be consistent. There's controlled vocabularies out there. There's a lot of different standards based on the type of research data that you're producing. There's a lot of information out there that you can look up to help you um, come up with different templates for your research data. File naming conventions, this is very important. And this is something that I know I definitely am guilty of not following. And I'm, I think it's a very common human trait to not be good about naming their files, or at least not be consistent about it. So we see this a lot, especially when you've got multiple people working with the set of data and they're all making changes. I mean, Google Docs has sort of helped us get over this hump, but for those of you who have exchanged, you know, drafts between email, it, it gets it gets really confusing. So it's a good idea, especially if you're working with a team of people to produce research data to come up with some sort of simple and brief file naming convention, 
I just threw this up as an example. It really depends on what you're producing um, and what sort of information you want to record about it. In some cases, you might want to drop the date in there. In some cases, you might not, but there might be some specific test number or trial number that you want to put in there. Um, the point is, is you want to make sure that you're consistent with it. Um, that helps your files sort in a, in a meaningful way. Um, it helps prevent duplication or perhaps overwriting of files. You <laughs> so file names should not be your only source of descriptive information, right? Like you don't want to have that file name that's just really, 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 really long because that's I mean, I can see where it's helpful, but it's it's really not helpful. And I've actually run into file names that are so long that my computer just can't handle it. Um, and I have to shorten it because it just goes crazy, especially if it's in like, if it's nested in five different directories, it's just gonna freak out and, and not handle it. So don't use your file name as the sole source of description. Have some metadata that lives in a spreadsheet with your data. Um, but it is helpful to have your file names be vaguely descriptive. Um, so the example that I have up on the slide is just having a numbered, a numbered file name versus you know, some sort of description and then that counter on the end of the file name. That's a little bit more helpful without being overly descriptive. Um, just some other best practices. When you're naming files, try not to have special characters and try not to use spaces or periods in them because that can confuse software programs that you might want to use to run fixity tests or to copy your files appropriately. So keep that in mind. Um, another aspect that we've, we've mentioned this before about accessibility and usability of your files is file formats. Um, again, make sure that you're, you know, if you can at all, save your files in some sort of open format. Um, depending on what type of data you're producing, there's all sorts of suggestions for open versions. A, a, an easy example is a Photoshop file. It's probably something a lot of us has, has worked with. It's very easy to create a file in Photoshop and export that file as a JPEG or a TIFF, right? And then you don't have to have that Photoshop software to access the file. In some cases, you do lose a little bit of information. Like I think if you produce a Photoshop file with layers and you extract that as a JPEG or a TIFF, you lose those layers. It just flattens it all into to one single image. Um, but you know, maybe you want to keep two copies, an open copy and a proprietary copy of that data. So I just wanted to point this, put this up here, because um, I, I, you just can't dig into all the, all the different options for file formats, because there's just so many out there. But there are a lot of resources, and this site and other file format charts um, are listed in the resources and tools handout that I have in the Google Drive. Okay. So I need to check the time. Holy smokes. Okay, we'll wrap this up pretty quick. Um, so the next question that I want to go to is where? Where can we actually store our data? Um, I'm going to talk about off-campus first. Um, depending on what type of data you have and what field you're in, there's a lot of different options and a lot of different recommendations. And of course, it depends where you're at in the research process. Are you trying to preserve your data and while you're you know, actively still working with that data and still creating that data? Or are you done with it and you just wanna put it in a preservation repository to sit and be accessible? Maybe you have security issues that you need to consider. So it, it really just depends. Um, but of course, some of the major enterprise size um, services for providing research, well, storage space for research data. You have Amazon, Amazon Web Services. They have that S3 storage. They also have Glacier Storage. Microsoft Azure um, also offers storage. Um, the Internet Archive, that's kind of an open option. I think if you put content in there, though, it might have to be publicly accessible. But um, that's generally free, which is awesome. And they have really nice viewers and tools to work with their data. 
um, I recommend hopping onto the registry of research data repositories and find, finding something that meets your specific needs. Because like I said before, it really just depends what your resources are and the structure of your data. On campus, um, we do have a couple different options. I mean, everyone's first thought should be the libraries, but it's sometimes not. Um, <laughs> but people generally think of UK ITS, campus IT, what do they have? How can they help? And that's a great place to start. Um, we in the libraries have learned that UK ITS is very helpful to help set up meetings with representatives of Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure or other storage providers. Um, I just recently learned that campus signed a contract with Amazon and we actually get less expensive rates now. So we had priced out some storage through Glacier before this contract was signed and we just decided it was too expensive. And then we had a meeting with the AWS representatives that was organized through campus ITS and the glacier storage rates were almost half as much as they were. So, you know, if you're really looking into something like that, I highly recommend talking to someone in ITS because they can help you out. Um, if you're someone who's doing some heavy analytics of your data, some high performance computing, there's the Center for Computational Sciences. They have a lot of Maybe not a lot, but they have quite a few very powerful machines that you can do analysis on. There's also this new group called the Research Computing Group, or at least that's sort of what they're calling themselves at this point. This is a mixture of people from UK ITS and from high performance computing. It's this new group of people that Special Collections has been meeting with pretty regularly and they've been awesome because they basically told us, we realize faculty and other departments on campus have preservation and computing needs that they can't get through Amazon or Microsoft Azure or they just simply don't have the capabilities to know how to set that up. And what they're trying to do is to fill that hole and help people figure out, you know, some sort of solution to meet their needs. And they've been really, really great. Um, so they're, they're sort of like consultants, but they also have helped us do a little bit of code development. And they've said that they have um, teams of students that um, are coming from computer sciences that you know, it's sort of like pairing a faculty member with a student on some sort of research product where the student gets some sort of experience that they can put on their resume and say, hey, I helped this faculty member do this project. Um, and then we, you know, we or our faculty get, get that help. So that's really exciting. And then, of course, I'd be remiss um, in not mentioning UK Knowledge. So that is our institutional repository that Adrian Ho oversees that, um, basically pres preserves a lot of publications um, and scholarly communications developed by faculty and students on campus. Tools and resources. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there to um, help you preserve your data. You don't have to do it alone. You don't have to know code to preserve your data. Um, so I'm just going to run through these very quickly. The first thing I want to talk about is the data management planning tools or DMP tool. Um, everybody should know about this. It's awesome. It's a software program or a web-based tool that has a lot of different templates that can help you think through the questions that you need to answer when coming up with a preservation plan. And they actually have templates that are specific to different sort of grant types. So if you have someone going out for a particular type of NSF grant, they can pull up a template that is specific for that grant. So it's great. I put this slide up here because um, the Research Data and Scholarly Communications Committee is overseeing this research data management at UK Research Guide. And there is a lot of information about DMP tool on there. So be sure to check that out. Um, <laughs> Again, there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, 
there's a lot of information about open tools. I mean, that's one nice thing about research data or preservation of research data. People really tend to want to make their tools and software programs available. Um, so you have this community-owned digital preservation tool registry where you can find tools that do what you need them to do. Uh, AV Preserve is another company that has built a couple really good free tools, including that Fixity tool that we're going to use. Um, there's different organizations like the Digital Curation Center, Library of Congress. I'm actually going to pull up this Google document. Come on. Okay, here we go. So I have uh, I have this Google Doc with tools and resources, and I just divvied it up between different organizations, um, different resources themselves, and then the actual tools, and then some file format charts. So you can poke around these um, and feel free to share this with whoever you think would, would find it useful. Um, and there's, I mean, this is really only a snippet. There's so much more information out there. It just, it just takes sitting down and doing a little bit of searching. So that was a lot of information. I think I just talked for an hour straight. It's crazy. But we're going to do this activity now. We're going to look at Fixity. So um, let's start by making sure that everybody has Fixity downloaded on their computer. There's instructions to do so on uh, in a Word doc in this preservation of research data site. Um, Go ahead and install it on your desktop. Try and launch it and then set up your email preferences. And I'm going to take this off and make sure that everybody here is good. OK, cool. Um, we're going to go ahead and just power through all of this. Um, and those of you who are having trouble setting up Fixity, you can just follow along. Um, here, let me. Let's do this. Okay, so Fixity uh, is a software developed by AV Preserve, and the goal of it is really to monitor file integrity through generating and validating checksums. So it generates the checksums, and it goes through and it checks those checksums. Basically, it just generates new checksums whenever you tell it to, and then it compares those checksums with the original checksums to see if anything's changed, if anything's gone bad. And it has a reporting feature that lets you know if you have any missing files or moved files, renamed files, or any sort of change just happened, which is really great because you... I just assume that very few people have enough time on their hands where they just want to spend 10% of their time generating checksums and comparing those checksums. So Fixity will do that in an automated way for you. Um, and it even emails those reports to you or anyone else on your team, which is pretty cool. Um, again, this, this alone is not a preservation system. It's just an important part of it. So I just want to make sure that's clear. So. If you installed Fixity, um, what you should see is this, this little interface right here. And um, hopefully everybody was able to go into preferences and go into their email setting and set up their sender email. So this is, it, it, whenever you get a report from Fixity, this uh, email that you're configuring right now, this is who that report is going to be from. So I have mine set up, and whenever there's a report, like let's say I send it to Christy Peters, it's going to look like it's an email from me. So that's what that is all about, and it's nice because you can hit check credentials, and it's it'll send you a little test email, um, and then it you know says it looks like it worked. Go ahead and check your email and make sure it's there. So. I know mine's working, so I'm just going to leave that. So that's the first thing that you want to do is make sure that that preference is set up. And um, if you downloaded the set of sample data in the preservation workshop 
Google Drive. Um, I just grabbed some data from <laughs> data.gov. Um, I grabbed some images from the Special Collections Research Center and then just a spreadsheet that we had. So I just tried to get a, you know, kind of a generic general set of data. If you save that somewhere on your computer, um, or you don't have to use that data if you have other data that you want to use. Um, we're going to use that to set up a, t a fixity scan on. So if you go to file, new project, um, we're going to call this test project. We're going to spell it correctly. Oh, well, okay. Let's try something else. Let's call it Sarah D project. Okay. So we're going to set up um, a scan. Like, I guess I'm trying to think of a, a real world example of what you might want to use this for. So let's say you have a bunch of photos or recordings that you generated as part of your research and you want to make sure that those files are not degrading you have them saved on your computer um, and so you are going to keep them all in a directory and we're going to create this project um, to scan those files or generate checksums and scan them and make sure that they're not degrading and you can decide whether you want that to be um, every couple months every couple weeks or even daily um, so you can, you know, check whatever's appropriate for you and you'll see your options will, will change. Um, so if you have it on monthly, this I think is, I think it runs once. I don't know if it's, um, like if this means January or once every one month or once every two months. Sorry, I'll have to look at the manual for that. Um, if you select it weekly, you can choose what day you want. And then daily, you're only presented with the time. Um, it's military time. So if you put 4 o'clock, it's going to run at 4 a.m. So we're going to do 1,400. Um, and then you have all these different options of whether or not you want this to run when you're on battery power. Um, if something goes wrong and it missed it and your, your computer re, you know, restarts, should it run Fixity when your computer restarts? Um, and then you can also say that you only want an email when there's something going wrong. If everything is okay, you don't care, you don't want to know. So you can set that up however you want. Um, and if your project has had a scan before, it'll, it'll say that under this last checked part. So that's the, ske the scheduling section. Um, and then you need to actually tell it what you're going to scan. And so I am just going to go to a random directory on my desktop. If you want at this point to navigate to that, that sample group of data that you downloaded, you can, you can do that. And you just select that directory. If you have your data stored in multiple places, you can select up to seven directory listings or directory paths. It won't let, yeah, I think it does actually have to be in a directory, yeah. And then um, for the recipient, recipient email address, you just want to put in whatever emails that you want this report to get sent to. So whether it's your own, maybe you have um, co-researchers that they should get this information to, um, whoever put their email addresses in. And then go to File, Save Settings. So if you just close it, it should still run, right? But we're actually going to test it. We're going to test and see how this works by going to File, Run Now. So you just click that. 
those exact same things are probably going to end up in these things. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> And this might be something that just simply runs better if you install it not on your desktop. It's just with permissions here. Oh, okay. Okay. Awesome. So if you hit run now, it's going to ask you to make sure that your, or it's going to tell you that it saved your settings and that it is currently scanning and to not close fixity. So I'm going to say, okay. And then it, does its business. Huh, I wonder how many finding aids I had in this directory that it's scanning. <laughs> I should have done the sample data set. Um, but I could just I could just say now whenever this is done, it's going to okay good. So it says scanning is completed and then this window should close automatically just that just that little report window the fixity window is going to stay open um so now what should happen is i should be able to go into my email and see this report it's going to tell me what happened here but there's another place where this report is going to show up as well and this is in the fixity directory that we downloaded that has the executable file in it so if you go into here and you go into the reports, you're actually going to have the report itself in that directory. So this is the same information that's being emailed. Oh, good. Right. So, okay. Here's the other thing. It's saving this data as a .tsv file, which can be readable through your text editor. So if you just, um, when you get this message, if you just say, I just want to select a program from a list of installed programs, and then it, you know, I'm just going to use Microsoft Notepad. Okay. So this is that report. This is the exact same information, and it pretty much looks the same. That's going to be emailed to me. So it tells you the project name that we are using SHA-256. Remember, this is that checksum protocol. Um, that we used or that Fixity uses to generate the checksums. It tells you how long it lasted, how many files were scanned. Um, and this is this is really just the first the first round. So you so it, it just lists all the different files and it gives you that whole file path. So this is the only actual that like that's the actual name of the file, but it gives you that whole path. So that's the report. And then if you want to see the actual checksums themselves, it does make that available. It's just not in the report folder. If you go back a level, it's in the history folder. Whoops. So you can open this too and see those checksums. So you see it gives you that whole file path with the file name. And then this is, whoops. This is that checksum that it that it recorded. So that is the unique identifier for your file. And this is what Fixity is going to do when it runs on this directory a day later, a week later, whatever that um, pattern is that you set up as part of your project. It's going to generate that checksum again, and it's going to compare these two and see what happened. So. What we can do is we can go into our sample data and um, I would like you guys to make some changes to those files. I want you to move something, maybe create a new directory and move it. I want you to delete a file and I want you to edit something, like go in there and change the text and duplicate something. Just get in there and mess up that data. And we're going to run this report again. We're going to see what happens. Um, yeah. So I noticed that the, um, when I downloaded Fixity, it, it told a zip file into my download. And then I un and compressed yeah, you extract. my download. So my file where, like, my history. Yeah. Is it's in your. It's in my download. If I move that out right here, it's going to subtract that. 
Um, I think if you move that, so that extracted package of the, the fixity package, I haven't tested this, but I think if you move it and keep it in its entirety, it should be okay. And it still works okay. What I would worry about is if you had your data that you're scanning and let's say you moved it to a different location, the next time it runs that scan, it's going to tell you that all of those files have moved because that, because that file path is different, which might be fine. It still might be okay. You just want to keep that in mind if you're if you need to move something for a particular reason so I need to go and futz around with my metadata or my research data I mean okay so I'm gonna delete something I'm going to rename something. I'm going to duplicate something. I'm going to make a new folder. Thankfully, you'll see that these files are all from 2014 and they're not really useful. They just happen to be living on my desktop. Okay, so I futzed around with the data and I am going to run Fixity on that directory again and we'll see what happens. So again, when this is done scanning, it's going to send me a report. Um, so that report will be in my email, but I can also go into that Fixity package directory and pull it up and pull it up in here. So we're going to do that. We're going to go into reports and we have the second report file that was generated. We're going to open this up. And it has let me know that there are two files that have been either moved or renamed. There's one new file. And I didn't actually go in and open a file and change it at all other than just renaming it. So it's actually differentiating between a file that's been renamed versus a file that's been edited, which is good. Um, and it lets me know that I did remove a file. And it actually calls out here which things are renamed, which things are new, which things have been removed, which is really helpful because it points you to exactly what needs to be addressed. And so if something happened, like let's say your files are just starting to disintegrate because sometimes this happens, files get glitchy, the ones in zero switch, it'll tell you which one needs to be replaced. And if you're following the lots of copies keep stuff safe sort of general preservation system, you can go to one of your other copies and pull that file and replace the corrupted file. Generate these checksums again and start fresh. So it's just, this is a, a good example of a really simple free tool that you can set up and it just does its thing. It sends you email reports, especially if you have this checked so that it's only going to email you when you have a warning or failure that you really don't need to do anything other than keep that data in the same place. So it's a pretty cool tool. Oh, right. Yes, that's the run upon restart. Yes. Yep, that's right. So there are um, a few less options on the Mac version. No, it's I had that in my notes. They actually are not available. And there's other um, there's other options that you can you can go in. You can dig in. Like you can change the checksum algorithm if you want. Um, you can exclude some files. Maybe you only want to generate checksums on certain files. So maybe Robert, this is how you would just do that one file on your desktop. 
I haven't played around with this since so I, I mostly work with just directories of files. But um, so there's some other options. The user guide's really good. And I would recommend to check out the other AV Preserve tools. I have them on the list of resources and tools. They have some good stuff that's, that's free and open. So do you guys have any burning digital preservation questions for me in the last few minutes? Nothing. <laughs> There's a lot out there and it really, I mean, I've said this so many times already, but it, it totally depends on what your needs are, what your resources are, um, how complex your metadata is. So it just, it just is going to require sitting down and spending a little bit of time searching through all these resources to see what is available and appropriate for you. Yeah. Um, I, uh, this is something that I think is, is great because I think it, it does the job, right? Like, I think this is a serious tool that you can definitely use for your research data. And if you're, I mean, the thing is, is it requires to, it requires you to have general understanding of preservation and preservation of digital data. So you kind of have to know what you're doing and why you're doing it to be able to set this up properly and what to do if it fails. Like that's the other thing. If you get a message that say that something's altered and you don't know what to do, I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's a larger problem. Um, but maybe that just means that they work with us as information professionals to help them with that. Um, they can they can listen to this webinar or watch this webinar <laughs> and learn about it. But yeah, I think this is a I think this is a very solid tool. And I think a lot of the tools out there, these tools are created to help people preserve their professional data, their personal data, whatever. It just depends on what type of data that is. So I don't think there's anything out there that's just like the kid version of, you know, fixity. It, it, it's all pretty serious if it meets your needs. Awesome. Has anyone actually been, like have you gotten a question from a faculty member or a student that's like, I have this data, I don't know what to do with it. Like has anyone been approached by that, with that? Yeah, yeah, I've heard rumblings but they're in um, very specific settings where we're talking with faculty about preservation of research data. So right. Right. And I you know, I, I wonder if people feel like they have the time to do these sorts of measures. Like that's the other thing that I think about. I mean we do it at the libraries because it's our job. In theory, it's your job to preserve your data too. But when it's in the middle of doing other research or trying to get grants or teaching your classes or running labs or whatever, it's, I mean, I guess that's why Fixity is good because it's, you just set it up and let it do its thing. But, but I mean, if we're taking research groups, we've got like, right? Right. Like, like, protocol, we're doing this. Right. With all of your groups, you know, across all of your life, all of your, like, it's not. Mm-hmm. Right. And setting this up for right? So right. That is the, the, the logistics of that. Are right. right. So I have not ever put together like a, I mean, I've put together a preservation plan for a grant application, but it's done knowing that I work with a group of people that preserve data. If you're someone doing research and you're generating data, like is someone normally saying 10% of my role on this project is the preservation? Like I'm covering the preservation aspects of that. I don't know if that's a thing or do they all just sort of say, well, well I'll help out on it. Does anyone 
head knee. Yeah, I don't know. I'd be curious to see how folks are, are tackling this and divvying up the time. Because I, I feel like if we say it's all of ours responsibility, it's easy for everybody to drop the ball. But Okay. Well, thanks for listening to me yammer away for an hour and a half. I appreciate it. Hope you guys walked away with something. Oh, good. A project came out of this. This is great. <laughs> okay, sign off. Bye, everybody.